Hi, my name is Carissa Armstrong, and I am a clinical associate professor in the Department of Health and Kinesiology in the College of Education and Human Development. And we are here to talk about our uh, project, but where there's hope, there's life. My name is Christine Bergeron, and I am a clinical professor and director of dance in the Department of Health and Kines in the Dance Science Program. The inspiration for this project has really been in the works for like 15 years, at least in our heads. And we've always kind of been a little nervous about doing a project because this project is about the Holocaust. And we aren't Jewish, so that kind of held us back a little bit, just nervous about making sure that we are being historically accurate and respectful. Um, and we didn't want to kind of cross any of those boundaries. So we actually put together a committee of people um, we were, are working with the Halal here at Texas A&M, and we are also working with um, someone is acting as our consultant um, that's from Purdue University. We have a community member that's also on our committees. Um, we also have a professor from the um, history department that's helping us with making sure that we're historically um, accurate, but also thinking about um, maybe some sensitive issues and, and how we address those and how we uh, manage those in a respectful way. We also are working with performance studies and the Department of Visualization um, because this project incorporates dancers, actors, and visualization. So not everybody understands how much research actually goes into a project like this. And so we just wanted to give you a little bit of background of the um, things that we have um, either done or seen um, and where we've taken the students um, to expand all of our knowledge of the Holocaust and its impact on the world in general. So um, both of Chris and I have read numerous books on the Holocaust and over just our time I think this project like I said has been in existence for us in our minds for about 15 years and as we got closer to kind of figuring out how we can navigate a, a size of a project like this, we um, increased kind of our, our research and our knowledge. Um, because when we started out, we didn't have much more than what you learned in school about the Holocaust, which we now know is like middle school. Um, but um, we wanted to kind of inform ourselves and also to kind of do the research to figure out what, what do we want to say? What, what is, what is the timeline that we want to use and what parts of it that we feel like people can connect to. Um, so that, that research component really helped us. We brought, we both have been to many Holocaust museums. Um, Chris has been internationally. Um, we both kind of went together um, nationally. We went to the one in DC. We've gone to the one in Houston, which we actually brought our dancers to. Um, we went to Canada for a conference and went to their Holocaust Museum and brought the dancers that were with us on that trip to the Holocaust Museum and talked to our students about how they felt and, and what that process was for them. And um, so the dancers are also kind of being educated through the process as well so that they understand the magnitude of what they're trying to portray to the audience. And it isn't just about the, the hand being here or the look being here, but more about what this truly means. Um, and we've given them some visuals and things like that to work with specific sections um, to help them connect to why we're doing this particular phrase or movement or formation um, and what that, in our minds at least, represents. And, but also for them to understand the emotional um, aspect of it for them as performers, but then also how that might impact their audience members. So we kind of continually bring that in. Um, so it isn't something that we just did at the beginning and, and then now we've kind of turned our back, if you will, on it as we progress through the project. It's something that we're continually um, bringing in and doing and, and we're we have a new set of dancers now because of COVID and graduation that we lost half our cast. So we now are figuring out some ways of how to bring them into the fold and, and bring them through that process as well. So they're not just learning what the choreography is, but every dancer has been through a process. So 
we've always seen this project as kind of three phases. Um, the first phase being an interactive dance theater performance that would be held in downtown Bryan. Um, stage two would be more of a traditional uh, full stage version and it would be an evening length work. Um, we have the majority of that work done. Um, we are working on um, two new works right now. You can see the dancers dancing in the background. Um, so we have one that is kind of nicknamed Train Car and then another one that is nicknamed Barracks. And um, we had a prop built, um, serves as a prop and a set for our dance that transforms from a bed um, to kind of a, a wall, which we kind of term the closet, um, which allows for the dancer to kind of hide. And then it also transforms into what looks like a, a rail car. So that prop set is used throughout the entire work and it will be highlighted in the two newer sections um, that we're working on to present the full stage version, hopefully, as long as we stay open, we see, we hope to have that in spring. Um, and that will either be a virtual performance um, if we are not allowed to have a live audience or the audience will be social distanced. Um, we have also had conversations with Rudder Auditorium um, because we would be able to social distance a greater number of people in that space. And then we have another stage for our project that we consider kind of stage three and that's an educational component. So one of our um, ideas and goals is to create a film. So we're working with two cinematographers to create a shortened version of the evening that's work to create um, a film version of it. And what we'd like to do with that is take that film and, it, and um, kind of pass it out to schools with some educational lesson planning and some um, things for students to not necessarily learn about the historical aspect of the Holocaust, which they will be learning at school at that time, but to kind of think about empathy and human rights in general and hate and how we, in a sense of community and how we can um, come together um, as a community, as a world, and have this work kind of be the beginning of that conversation. Um, we're working with a, a local school right now to actually take the traveling, touring aspect of this performance and um, go and do it at their school. And as part of that, we're working with their advanced European and their theater classes. And we also are going to kind of start to build and develop that educational component and work with those teachers to help us build that, those lesson plans and build those um, educational materials that will kind of go along as a packet to the schools. So we were in the middle, oh, well, I guess almost finished with stage one, which was the interactive performance. We had our dress rehearsal in downtown Bryan in each of the venues, and we had a test audience that we sent through that process. Um, everything worked fabulous um, with the small little bumps here and there, which always happens when you do a tech dress, essentially. And then the university shut down probably about a week or two later. So um, we were on hold for um, all of that time and into the summer. Uh, we came back this fall unsure really what was going to happen, uh, but we knew that we wanted to continue with this project and get to a point where we could present it to the public. So we talked to our collaborators and the general consensus was that the spaces downtown were not large enough to provide social distancing between the audience and the dancers. So we decided that we would put the dancers on film and then still have the audience transition from one performance space to another. When COVID hit, we had to make a lot of adjustments other than us changing the idea of having live dancers in the space to film. We also had to think about kind of some COVID protocols and what would be best and safest for our performers. So a lot of the sections, uh, larger sections, had 17 dancers in it at one point, and we dropped that down to nine dancers so we could try to maintain at least relatively close to that, like 10 grouping. 
And our dancers also had to uh, screen themselves for, you know, do they have any of these symptoms? We uh, took their temperature before every rehearsal. They have to do hand sanitizing between every run of the dance. Um, they're wearing masks. And then when we have our sessions where we're giving them notes and feedback, they kind of find their own um, space to be in as we give those notes instead of kind of like being on top of each other. As we went into the theater, we also kind of had to take those types of things in consideration. So all of our crew had masks on. We had permission in that space because of the environment that the performers didn't need to have masks, but we still felt like the dance itself is very, there's parts of it that's very close knit that we didn't feel comfortable with those dancers not having masks on. So we still had them dance with skin tone masks on. The soloist uh, didn't have masks on, but we kind of had like a, a call that said, hey, crew, stay back. Um, this dancer's not gonna have their mask on and their, their mask was off to the side um, because they were a single soloist in this space. Um, so there's a lot of things that we had to adapt and consider as we um, try to move forward with the project, but with some COVID guidelines um, as part of that. So welcome. Uh, we'll introduce ourselves first, I guess. I'm uh, Dr. Uh, James Ball in the Department of Performance Studies at Texas A&M University. Ken Quackenbush, lecturer for the Department of Performance Studies at Texas A&M University. Uh, Adam Seip, I'm a professor of history at Texas A&M. So we've all been very excited to be uh, working on this uh, project, but uh, where there's hope, there's life. Um, we were brought onto the project uh, in early stages uh, uh, and tasked with finding a way to integrate theater into what our colleagues in dance were already doing. So we knew it was going to be a site-specific promenade performance in downtown Bryan, uh, and we knew that what our actors would need to do is move performers from site to site, I'm sorry, move audience from site to site uh, uh, to see each of the, the dance pieces that had been put together uh, and kind of uh, uh, curate the audience's experience of them, providing other moments of interaction. At the start, we didn't know quite what these would look like, uh, and we hit upon using a, a particular technique of the, the Tectonic Theater Company called Moment Work. Uh, to uh, develop these pieces with, with a group of actors uh, who were studying under uh, Professor Quackenbush uh, in her introduction to acting class. I think it was a really perfect fit because one of the things about moment work is that you take away some of your preconceived notions as to how performing works. And for uh, people who are less experienced and new, newer, to performing uh, or new to performing, uh, it was a little easier for them to jump in and start creating. Um, and it was very interesting for them at first saying, so they're dancing and we're gonna talk. Mm -hmm. And how that slowly changed into, we're gonna break everything out into moments and the aspects of the human voice or interacting with a space or then interacting with each other, interacting with an audience, interacting with a prop, became so much more, uh, had so much more weight and intensity. And then looking at the dance pieces and their each weight and voice and feeling how those could mesh or complement or create a, a through way for the audience to be prepared for the next one or leave the other behind. So everything got to be crafted in, in a really lovely um, and small way. Uh, this wasn't creating a giant, you know, we weren't doing five acts or something. This was m m moments, <laughs> you know. Uh, so it was a lovely, lovely project. And I know for a fact that my students learned a lot, a lot. So, Even without performing. Yeah, and so as we got into it, uh, we had a lot of conversations about how to represent the history, the degree to which we wanted to be kind of specific and realistic to the, the period of World War II and before, uh, uh, and the ways in which we wanted to use abstraction um, to represent the period. Uh, and we knew since we were building things from scratch, uh, we were cautious about the degree to which we wanted to do scripting or not do scripting of our own. Um, and so that's when we turned to Dr. Seip in the, the history department 
uh, to, to give us a hand grounding what we were doing in, in reports from the period. So, so I, was, I was brought into the project initially to, to sort of talk to um, some of the, the creators about some of the possible political sensitivities and, and some ways uh, that, that this performance might honor the memories of, of those who died and those who suffered. Um, and uh, got into some really interesting conversations with, with everyone on the production team and, and all the creative talent. And it's, it's really been, been fascinating watching this grow. Uh, and then I was specifically asked to identify some texts which could be either presented or read. Uh, and, and I've talked to uh, the creative team about the, the, the course of the story. And, and we, of course, agreed that this wasn't going to be an attempt to, to recreate history or, or the historical record, but to represent a set of experiences. So I was asked to find some, some selections, uh, and I, I chose eight, um, largely drawn from work that I've done with students as I've taught the Holocaust at, at Texas A&M. Uh, and the eight selections that I, I found range from the written reaction of a Hamburg school teacher to of the celebration of Hitler's ascendancy to the chancellorship in January 1933 through to the end of the war and really to the, to the American encounter with the Holocaust is something that I'm very interested in in my own scholarly work. And I did all of this uh, before COVID. And when I was going back and looking at the material that I had submitted, one thing really struck me, and that is the last of the, of the selections that I made um, which I'm going to read a, a little excerpt from, is actually grimly appropriate for our, our current moment because, um, as, as some people watching this may know, uh, many Americans first learned of what we today call the Holocaust via the medium of radio, and, and particularly the, the, the extraordinary broadcast in April 1945 of the journalist Edward R. Murrow, uh, who, he, it's called the broadcast from Buchenwald, though he broadcast it actually after he returned to London a few days later. And he, he closed with, with the following thought, and I'll read it briefly. He wrote, he, he said, I pray you to believe what I have said about Buchenwald. I have reported what I saw and heard, but only a part of it. For most of it, I have no words. Dead men are plentiful in war, but the living dead, more than 20,000 of them in one camp, and the country around that was pleasing to the eye, and the Germans were well-fed and well-dressed. American trucks were rolling toward the rear filled with prisoners. Soon they would be eating American rations, as much for a meal as the men at Buchenwald received in four days. If I have offended you by this rather mild account of Buchenwald, I am not in the least sorry. Um, it was a, an audio representation of what he had encountered. And at a time when we are often unable to see each other, at least up close, um, perhaps it's a reminder that there are many, many media to communicate words, to communicate ideas, to com communicate images, uh, some of which prove to be indelible. So that's my thought on how I play a role in the creative process, and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing this project continue in all of the different forms that we've been talking about. Yeah, and it was quite a moment then in, in March when the project suddenly got derailed. And I, I hadn't been thinking about those texts in terms of uh, uh, kind of how they articulated, you know, world historical events across distances in the same way that, that we're experiencing now. And how was it for you in class and with your students when, when you discovered the, the things weren't gonna quite finish out the way we thought they were? Well, you know, and I think part of it too is that we didn't really think that at the beginning. We thought there'd be a, a much, obviously, a, a much shorter delay. Um, so there was that feeling of kind of limbo. But once I think it sunk in that we it, we were we weren't going to be able to do it in a time frame that would include students who weren't going who were going to graduate who uh, couldn't take the same class again, you know, or whatever, um, for whatever reasons wouldn't be able to participate. Uh, it was heartbreaking. I mean, it's heartbreaking for performers to be so close to doing something and then having to just stop and hold on to it. Um, and that was very difficult, but there has been, I know the level of interest was very high given the amount of students who have asked, what can we do now? What else can we do? Are we maybe still gonna do it later? I, I loved being a part of this. It, there was a feeling of ownership 
that I think most students don't have when they're, you know, I've been cast in a show. Um, there was an emotional connection um, that developed with all the layers and layers and thought that went into this, um, these, these moments. Um, and which surprised me, I thought our biggest hurdle was going to be, you know, no, you don't get the big scene or a monologue or it's not going to be a big love story with tap dancing or, you know, I was worried that the material plus the way it was being presented would seem less attractive to someone who was focused on performing and instead they were more attached to the pro process because it was theirs mm -hmm. and they were part of something bigger at the same time. Um, and it meant so much to them. So uh, what we did instead was reflect a lot on, on that, those feelings and what was, what was um, um, created and how that, how that felt um, and what reflectively what the students got from the entire experience. And we're going to turn what would have been live performers interacting and leading audience uh, into uh, sound walks, into uh, uh, short uh, interstitial audio pieces that an audience member will listen to. They'll get directions from one location to the next. And they will, of course, hear these reports from the, the, the 1930s and 40s that uh, Dr. Syde provided us. Again, uh, performed by one of our actors, because we think even though you know, uh, we could use recorded audio from the period in this situation. We think that part of our intervention is to have a live performing body or recorded performing body in this sense, uh, 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 revoicing these things almost a century later, right? That that is the, the, the way that theater intervenes to make them alive for audiences uh, in the present. So we're very excited uh, to, to do this work in this new way. And, Hi, my name is Iman Zubaydi, and I'm a Master of Fine Arts graduate student representing the Visual Development team, which involves undergraduate students and faculty members from the Visualization Department. Our main role has been focused on creating immersive visuals, which involve particle simulations, reactive visuals, and motion graphics for two performances, the opening and the closing acts. Originally, we planned to use projection mapping to, as a tool to accompany these dancers in these two performances. For the first performance, which is called Hitler's Speech, we wanted to make the audience feel like they're at one of Hitler's rallies. We also wanted to represent his rise to power. And so we decided to use projection mapping to transform the space around the dancer. This meant that we had planned to use screens around the dancers as a tool to create these effects. In contrast, for the last performance, instead of per projecting around the dancers. We wanted to project on top of the dancers um, as a means to emphasize their emotions that were relating to liberation and hope. So we've been collaborating with these dancers. We set up a session in our studio against the green screen where we would try and record these dancers' movements. Um, however, instead of using a normal camera, we decided to use 3D data collection technology. This was super helpful because we were able to record their movements in 3D space and then take that into a visual development software um, where we can create visuals that would react to these movements. Um, it definitely gave us a lot of flexibility uh, to work on our own time, uh, which means that we didn't need the dancers to be there physically. Uh, and that definitely also created an efficient collaboration between the two departments. We also collaborated with the history department to try and make sure that we're getting an accurate representation of the visuals that we're using or the information that we're trying to portray. Um, so some of that involved trying to get newspaper references from legitimate sources. Due to COVID-19, we are trying to think of ways to mitigate the risks that involve everybody in the production. This means that the original ideas are now being adapted into a film that would be previewed instead of a live performance. On our part, we're trying to think of ways to involve our visuals and edit them into the film so we can blend the live action footage with our 2D and 3D visual design. Looking forward, we really hope that we can still work on a live version of this production um, so we can incorporate projection mapping in the way that we had planned originally. Um, it would be really interesting to think of other ways to use immersive technology like virtual reality maybe to make this performance or make this production much more available for people online.